And we get it rolling on the Krug Show. Hope everybody's having a great day. It is April the 2nd. That's right. We made it past April Fool's Day. 9.08 on the West Coast. Eight minutes after noon on the East Coast. But none of that matters because we're both hanging west. Guy Haberman in the house. A little dual stream with uh, Guy and myself. Guy, I saw you were kicking butt in the uh, in the uh, in that little media madness pool, man. You were, what's you were, what's the latest? Well, I don't know about the latest. I mean, the oh. latest. I, I it was the final four. I think I was getting destroyed by Croc, and I think um, our buddy Brad. Br- you know, it's funny. There's a lot of people that don't know Brad, and then there's other people that you know. It's like Brad is a force of nature. Brad right. Graham, and Brad Graham was taking down. Last I checked was taking down the great Matt Mayoko. Um, and to a lot of people, oh, that's so Mayoko totally... Beat me. Mayoko, so Mayoko beat you? Beat me. Yeah, I'm, well, I know I was up against Mayoko. I, I assumed I was going to get my ass kicked. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, it's funny. I'm up against... Uh, I was up against um, uh, the guy who actually is the head of the of that website. Uh uh oh, okay that's that's bad news for you yeah uh what's his name Guerra, rob Guerra, rob stats Guerra, guerrera and yeah. then somehow i encouraged my audience to rise up rise up i said and take me take down stats and they did me a, they did me a solid then i had barrows in the next round and i'm like ah, i'm losing to barrows i'll lose to barrows everybody loves barrows you know barrows is barrows and everybody loves them but somehow I got by Barrows, but then I got in this round with Croc, and Croc is, as I believe, put me away or is in the in the in the uh, midst of putting gotcha. me away. He's he's your C- Caitlin Clark. <laughs> there you go. Um, we've got this one from Invader Forty Nine ers who said, "Guy had throat surgery." Yeah, guy, you don't sound quite the same, but we know you're on the mend. Uh, tell that's us your they, tell us your, tell your condition. <laughs> My condition is uh, I had a RFK Jr. transplant. I was like, make me sound like <laughs> I want to run for president. Trent, let me sound, make me sound like Trent Balky. <laughs> right. uh, let's see, a week ago, Friday, so like almost a week and a half ago, I had a vocal cord procedure. Some would call it a surgery. There was a surgeon uh, to laser a bump off of uh, one of my vocal cords that had been bothering me for like a year when I would do games, especially like when I would try to project my voice. So this is just the uh, the normal rehabilitation. When I texted you yesterday about doing a show, I said, if you can stand this voice for an hour, we can do a show. Uh, <laughs> so th- this there's no harm in me talking. I don't need to go lay down. I'm uh, I'm not doing damage to my voice by uh, by talking. So I just I just sound like this. You know, it's not to- laryngitis. It's not, not something. Not that he- yeah, you're not sipping on uh, on on. Or are you sipping on tea? I mean, what is the rehab uh, uh, method? Is, or is it just, hey, you know what? Just hang out. It'll come back. Yeah, just do your thing. Uh, don't push it. But, you know, it's I'm not screaming and yelling. I went to Springsteen on Sunday. I didn't scream and yell. Uh, and, um, you know, I've got a vocal coach that I'm going to start seeing. Uh, she's going to make sure I might, they think it happened because my vocal cords hit in the wrong, in the wrong place because of the way I talk. Uh-huh. So, uh, you know, I've been talking to, I've been doing some vocal exercise. I got to do so. I did some warm ups today. I warmed up to get to this today, Larry. Uh, really? But, how was the warm up? Uh, sprints? Any, any heavy lifting? Of, yep. Yep. A lot of push ups. A lot of push ups. <laughs> well, we, we'll take you in any form, dude, because of course your content is phenomenal and we always love rapping with you. Um, we'll Likewise, get, get into a bunch of Niner stuff today. Um, and you know, it's here we are. It's it's the second of April. We're inside the draft window. The draft is literally three weeks away, and the 49ers, for the first time in a couple of years, have a number one pick because they did not trade this one for Trey Lance. So surprise, surprise, the Niners are due to pick at 31. And the the big story surrounding the 49ers is a story that people, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of. I'm sure most people are tired of, and that is the future of Brandon Ayuk and and what's going to happen to Ayuk. You know, it's funny. You get into the season. Well, there's a million stories, right? You know, you go to 
to uh, down to Santa Clara. You talk to player A. You ask him five or six questions. There might be a story or two out of that. I go down there, do the same damn thing. There may be a story or two out of that. Then there's the the stories that we see on the practice field, and it's like you look up and you're like, hey, there's like 15, 20 stories. In the off season, it's usually not the way it goes. Uh, <laughs> Last year at this time, there were a lot of people going, Krug, will you stop saying that Trey Lance is going to be traded? He is our guy long term. He is not going to be traded. Shut up about you and your trades. And sure enough, he was traded. Unfortunately, it didn't happen until August. So that was still four more months of this. Um, but this offseason, the, the the kind of the story that won't die is this Brandon Ayuk, Willie Woney. Do they want him? Do they not? Are they going to trade him? Are they going to trade Debo? You know, they're working out guys that are supposed to go in the middle of the first round, but they don't have a middle of the first round pick. So that makes you think that maybe he will get dealt. Then you have people saying, you know what? They're really Mike Garofolo from the uh, NFL network. They're very far apart in their two offers. Um, and then the next day you've got Lynch. Hey, you know, we really want this guy and this and that. Before we get into some IUK stuff, where do you actually think this is? I mean, can, it's very difficult to separate the reports from fact. Uh, do you think he's a Niner, always going to be a Niner, and you know uh, Shanahan and Lynch are absolutely in love and they'll do whatever they it takes? Do you think they've got a price and a cutoff point where they're like, if it gets beyond this, we're trading this guy? Uh, or do you think that the, the the master plan is to trade this guy? I mean, it, if you told me the master plan was to trade Ayuk for a mid-first-round pick, take a tackle, and then take a receiver at 31 in this draft, I could make an argument for some damn good receivers at 31. What do you think the master plan is with Ayuk, if you had to guess? Well, I think the the master plan is for him to be Brock Purdy's catching partner for the next seven years. I mean, I think that that is their ideal situation because I think when you look at his age, you look at all their expensive players, which if he stays, he'll become one. He is the one that fits on Brock's timeline the best, right? He fits right. better than Kittle and McCaffrey and Debo. Uh, without, I guess I'm close. He's on the same timeline as Juwan Jennings from like a, when he was drafted standpoint, he's young. When you pay Brandon Ayuk, you're paying for his prime, Larry. You're not paying for past performance. And I think one of the worst, not one of the worst things, but like I, I think in, in some way they fear the, the um, unlikely, which would be somebody offering them a pick that they couldn't refuse, right? Somebody doing something illogical, like offering a mid first round pick for Brandon Ayuk, which doesn't, it doesn't make sense to do that. You can get the third, fourth best receiver with a mid round pick in the first round this year. So somebody shouldn't do that. Like it doesn't, it doesn't pencil, but if somebody did that, I mean, for what's best for the organization, I think they'd feel like, God, this is such great value. Even though they know you're not getting Brandon Ayuk's equivalent right now, maybe in three years, maybe in two years, but it, it, in all likelihood, not right now. Right. But I, I think the most likely outcome is he's playing. And I've said this for a while, Larry, that he's playing this year on the fifth year option. And um, I think the conversation we're having about him now is like a more real conversation next year as it relates to Debo. So you think Debo may get moved next year is what you're thinking? Because, I mean, if you if you ask me, and I've been talking about this the last couple weeks or last couple days, I think Ayuk's coming back. I think, D, I think they are going to draft a receiver somewhere in their first two or three picks. I would not be surprised if the Niners drafted a receiver either in the first or second round. Um, I could see it. I could see it. And then maybe a year from now, trading Debo Samuel, if that receiver comes of age a little bit, um, for maybe something that's not kind of paltry in return, you know, maybe like a fourth-round pick, maybe a fifth-round pick or something like that next year to some team that's not one of your arch rivals in either conference. That's kind of what I see as yeah. far as wide receiver. I don't, I can't imagine. I, I love Xavier um, Leggett yeah. or Leggett from South Carolina. I see a lot of AJ Brown in him. I was watching path to the draft last night and sure enough, they made that comparison. 
mm-hmm. and it's an easy comparison to make, right? They both played in the SEC. They're both big and strong and fast and physical. Um, I can see that. I can see Malachi Corley being compared to a Debo Samuel out of Western Kentucky. Um, I can see those comparisons, but it's it's such a projection. I mean, NFL wide receivers, I mean, Jerry, the greatest receiver of all time, um, wasn't great as a rookie. You know, he was he was far better as a second year player. So for whatever reason, and we could probably talk to Shanahan or some wide receiver coach about the intricacies of the, the position. But for some reason, wide receiver is like a almost like a red shirt position where you can draft a guy and for every Randy Moss, there's like a hundred guys who just can't do anything that rookie year and then come out in that second year. And they're like, Hey, wow, look at this guy. This guy's ready to roll. Uh, He knows the offense. He's quick in and out of the breaks. He's, you know, he's so refined and um, you know, it's, 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 so I, I don't know that if you're a team in a Super Bowl window that it makes sense to trade, a, a veteran wide receiver who's cooking, who's an all pro. Even if you get your hand picked receiver in the draft, I just don't know if it makes sense. Yeah. Well, I don't think you're going to get, you're not getting the top three receiver, even with an IU trade. It does not make sense for this year. Maybe it makes sense for six years from now, but you're really replacing the guy that, you know, like replacing Ayuk with another receiver right now, you're replacing the wrong guy. You're replacing the younger, cheaper guy. Right. It makes right. more sense to replace Debo if you're going to replace anybody right now. And when you, you know, the year to replace Debo is next year because his dead cap hit comes down precipitously. So, like, that's that to me is the window. Next year is the window. Um, and, you know, the beauty with Ayuk, like, he's still showing up. He's still working out. He still makes $14 million this year. Like, it's a significant increase in salary for him this year. So, it's not like he's playing on a $2 million contract. So, you know, like, what that means is, he can afford to wait for next year's contract. He can, you know. Now, uh, as for the receiver p- part of it, like the draft part of it, I mean, they're probably going to draft one to your point. Like, I went back and looked at all their seven drafts. This will be their eight. This will be Kyle and John's eighth draft, okay? In the previous seven drafts, they've – last year was the first year in which they didn't take some combination – of multiple receivers and running backs. They've done receiver and running back or receiver and receiver or running back and running back every year until last year. Last year, they drafted Ronnie Bell. The year before, it was Ty Davis, Price, and Danny Gray. The year before, it was Trey Sermon and Elijah Mitchell. The year before, Ayuka Jennings. 19, it was Debo and Jalen Hurd. 18, it was Pettis and Richie James. 17, it was Joe Williams and Trent Taylor. So they've taken nine receivers, four running backs, and almost every year they take some combination of multiples of that position. So they're doing it, Larry. Like they're they're taking a receiver and a running back or they're taking two receivers or they're like that's going to happen in this year's draft. It just it happens almost every year for them. It really shows too how difficult it is to handicap those two positions at its core because those yeah. guys have the Niners have swung and missed. And we'll look at the Niner draft history under Lynch and Shanahan later on in this stream. Um, all right. So I entitled the stream Will the 49ers draft their next star wide receiver uh in this upcoming draft? And um I don't know. I mean I, I I, I think there's I think this is a really intriguing draft for star wide receivers. I mean, um obviously Harrison at the top, Malik Neighbors, Adunze, I'm not a huge fan of. Brian Thomas. Oh. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Troy Franklin either. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Lad McConkey. He scored two touchdowns all year. Then there's Adonai Mitchell, there's the burner, Xavier Worthy, Keon Coleman, Roman Wilson, Xavier Leggett or Leggett. Ricky Pearsall, Malachi Corley, Devontae Walker. I mean, this is a really loaded group. Rice's kid, Jalen McMillan, uh, Javon Baker from Central Florida, who's really good. Ooh, I like um, him. McCaffrey, you know, his brother from Rice had a fin- phenomenal year. And then even down the list, I think there's some guys. Marcus Rosamy, Jack Saint from Georgia, I think's very underrated player. Isaiah Williams from Illinois, very underrated player. Uh, Bub Means from Pittsburgh can really run at 6'2", 215 pounds. 
There's some guys who can really, really run too in this thing. You go deep down the list. Ty- Tyler Harrell from Miami is an absolute blazer at at uh, six feet, two hundred and ten pounds or so. Um, there's a bunch of receivers, and then we didn't even talk about the slot receivers. I mean, then there's then there's a whole group of guys who operate out of the slot. I mean, Malik Washington from Virginia is amazing. Uh, a lot of people like Anthony Gold from uh, Gould from uh, Gould. Oregon State. Um, and Ania Smith from A&M is a good player. I've watched him for years. Jaquan Burton from Flor- uh, Florida Atlantic. What do you think, guy? Is there a receiver that, that you think fits the Niners specifically, or is there a receiver that you like that you'd love to see them grab in this draft? Well, I mean, I, I, I wish his name was something else because it just – if it, it, it's uh, it feels too easy, but I I do like Brendan Rice a lot. <clears throat> uh, I like Jacob Cowing. I don't know if you did you mention Jacob Cowing at Arizona? No, from Arizona, yeah. You know, another um, good receiver. I like Javon Baker from UCF, who you mentioned. Like, uh, you know, they they had a really explosive passing game with a kind of inaccurate quarterback, uh, and they went through some quarterback issues. At UCF this year, their their guy Jr. John Rice Plumley got hurt and then came back, and um, and they had a really good offense. Like they had two really good receivers. They had a good run game. It all fit together. He catches a lot. I haven't looked at like his catch percentages or anything, but what from what I remember, he catches a lot of stuff. Just like in his vicinity, I think he's a good catch, a pass catcher. Um, so I mean, th- those are a few names, but like to me, that list can keep going and it's just listening to you talk like it, i think they're drafting multiple receivers in this draft even though it feels kind of crazy to say because you look you go well they got jennings um i don't you know i i'm i'm kind of past the danny gray ronnie bell's gonna have to earn it back right kind of situation so like to me it feels like a draft where you you can you can draft multiple receivers and guys who will like maybe one of them starts returning for you right away the other, you know what I mean? Like, I think you can get yeah. some snaps because when you look around the team, it's just it, where, where do you find snaps for somebody? It, just go through the positions, right? Like, where are snaps available? Snaps are available at corner right now, right? There's mm-hmm. snaps available at corner. Maybe um, linebacker. Maybe linebacker. There's kind of always snaps available if you can earn them on the defensive line for this team. Yeah, no doubt. We'll see what happens by, I guess the deadline is tomorrow, but there might be some snaps available at tight end, depending right on what happens with Brock right. Wright. And then offensive line, potentially, right? There's snaps available on the offensive line. There's not really a lot of snaps. If you look at, if we went back and looked at how many snaps Ray Ray played last year, what do you have like 18 targets? I mean, maybe, maybe that's high, but they, but those are, somebody has to get those targets. So there is a spot for somebody to come in be a returner, get 20 targets, um, and then become maybe a bigger piece of the puzzle next year. So you can kind of soft red shirt if you're a receiver on the Niners. So are you saying that any receiver the Niners draft has to have returnability, you think? No. I mean, like this Brendan Rice, he's not a returner, right? He kicked, he kicked returned a little bit. Uh, definitely Colorado okay. he did. Yeah. He doesn't look like you're – but I think the return is different all of a sudden. Like I, one of my early theories on the return, Larry, is are do running backs make more sense as returners now? Well, they're more usually more durable. You know, but they run lower to the ground. Your, like now, it's like a short area. Find one hole and hit it. Right. Right. Like I just wonder if the I don't know the XFL kick returns I've watched were pretty. They lacked creativity. <laughs> like so, I got my theory being you need a like a running back who plays behind a shitty offensive line. Like that's what your returner needs to be now. Cause you got like linebackers out there trying to block in small areas. Like it's just a weird, it's a weird deal all of a sudden. And I wonder if running backs will thrive in the new NFL kickoff. So, but to answer your question, no, I don't, I mean, if you had to, you could put, I know people won't like it. You could put Christian back there, Um, but you could put Ronnie Bell back there. Like whatever. I'm not overly concerned about it, especially if you take two guys. Take your best peer receiver first and then take a guy that's a little more of a Swiss Army knife second. I don't, you know, let's hone in on Brendan Rice for just a second. What do you think of him as far as 
you know, I mean, do you think the Niners would be a good spot for him? I mean, you know, there's there, there's obviously the comparison to Jerry, but Jerry, to me, yeah. it's like Jerry is so so his his you know he's so in his own category that I don't really think anybody would draw any comparisons and say, well, is he as good as his dad? I mean, obviously, he's not his dad. His dad. It's like comparing Pete Rose to Pete Rose Jr. or something. You know, it's like, come on. I mean. <laughs> There's there's only one there's only one Jerry, um, yeah. But I like this kid, and the and and there's several things about his game that I really really like. One, he scored a touchdown on every five point two catches, um, and that's a great you know that, that. And if you watch him, like he's really he's not the explosive athlete that Jerry was, but he's not a bad athlete. And he's got good height. He's got good size. And then when you watch him, um, Brendan Rice, you see a guy who it's like you can see that football is important to him. You know what I mean? It's like the guy runs the routes and he does a lot of the things. His concentration, I felt, seemed like better than the typical college receiver. His, um, His, all of his technique as far as, just, you know, his hand placement when he would turn around, his breaks, in and out of the breaks. So he just seemed like a more refined receiver than your typical than your typical receiver. I mean, he just he college receiver. He just looked so much more refined. Um, and obviously his father is the legendary Jerry Rice, who was awesome at Mississippi Valley State and great with the Niners and the greatest wide receiver of all time. But what what do you think? What do you think is 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 it better for Brendan Rice to be a Niner or to not be a Niner? I don't think it matters because I think he can handle it. Like I've watched him a lot in his career going back to Colorado. He is not phased by being Jerry Sutton. And, and at first you thought, well, maybe he's a Colorado. Then he goes to SC where the light is brighter. It didn't change him at all. So I, I don't think it matters one bit to him if he's a Steeler or a Niner. Um, I mean, maybe it matters to him, but I don't think it's going to affect him in any way. I think there's a lesson. Uh, in the Danny Gray draft pick for the 49ers. And I think Brendan Rice is a great example of the opposite. I think one of the lessons for the Niners, and and this applied to Trey as well, but more so from a receiver standpoint, Danny Gray. If you're a one-trick pony, if we're bringing you in to say, okay, you do one specific thing, you're fast. And Debo and Ayuk and Jennings, they're not fast like you. So we're going to put you in specific spots where it's, a chance for the fast guy. It's going to be really hard to get on the field because in order to really earn playing time and earn a snap, you have to be consistent. You have to be even across the board. You have to be a good route runner, a good pass catcher. Uh, you've got to be able to do everything because these other guys, Ayuk and Debo, they do a little everything, especially Brandon, right? And so when you try to fit a piece in who just does one thing, to a lineup of guys who can do multiple things. It's really awkward. It's difficult to find a spot for that player where you put them on the field three times a game, but then somebody else is open because they ran a good route, you know? And I think what Brendan Rice is, is the kind of guy who you can give him, I think seven to 15 snaps a game early. And you're not looking for him to do just one thing. Like that's why Danny Gray can't get on the field. Because you can't give him 15 snaps because he's only doing one thing, right? Like, to me, Brendan Rice is a little like the what what we saw from Chris Conley late in the year, right? What was Chris Conley? He was on the field and ready for whatever the moment required of him. And when the moment required him to run a route that he never won with Brock and catch the ball, he did it. And I think that's Brendan because Brendan Rice can run every route. And because he's so mature as as a football player, that I can put him out there for 10 to 15 snaps and he will run the right route 10 to 15 times and twice the ball might come his way. So when you have specialty receivers, like Danny Gray needs to be on a team or needed to be on a team where he's like, they're bad. And he's like their number two guy. And he just gets to run and run and run and run and run. And four times a game, they hit him. And it's like, well, it doesn't matter that his routes weren't crisp or he dropped two balls. On the Niners, you have to run crisp routes and you can't drop the ball because you may not get another shot, right? And so that's the type of player they got to draft. They have to draft a player who can get on the field with consistency first. 
And then that will create production for that guy. And I think that's what Brendan Rice is. And I think that's that to me is the lesson in Danny Gray. Well, and, and you saw the latest on Danny Gray, right? With the whole. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I don't know if Danny Gray's head's in the right spot. To me, just being in the locker room and being around him, it seems like he lacks confidence. And um, I don't know. I mean, I, I wonder about the durability of the kid. Seems like every hit he takes is, you know, he's he's it, it hurts him. Um, it just he's, he just seems like, yeah, I mean, I understand why Kyle wants him. And I've talked to Kyle about this before. Hey, the advantage of having the guy that can run off the the top of the defense and and stretch the field and create space. And and that's what Danny's there for. But if you don't get on the field, you're not creating Jack. Yeah, you, you got to be I mean? you got to be on the field for other stuff, too. Right, that yeah. over the top throw, such a low percentage throw, that if you can't do other stuff, then it's, you know, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, so Brendan Rice can do so many things that you can put him on the field in a normal situation, and just expect that he'll be in the right place at the right time. Two other receivers I want to talk about. One is this kid out of Virginia, Malik Washington, and dumpster fire Dan is in here twice. He says, give me Malik Washington for value. And then he came back with, I love Malik Washington. I'd take him in the third or fourth round or over most of these guys. Uh, Dumpster Fire Dan and I are in a in lockstep on this one. We're both uh, big fans of of Malik Washington. I, I, I love this kid. He was a he's a grad student. He's only a 5'8", 194 pound receiver. Started at Northwestern, transferred to UVA grad student he's originally from lawrenceville georgia um and he was one of the 10 semifinalists for the blitnikoff award this guy just all he does is go out there and catch and catch and catch he's also first team uh academic all-american so he's a smart guy he was voted a team captain so he's somewhat somewhat of a leader um you know this guy was great in high school he was great at northwestern uh, he's great at Virginia. Um, you know, he was a three-time scholar athlete in high school. So, I mean, he's, he's that kind of a guy. He lettered four times in track, um, you know, claimed a state title and a national championship in 2017 in the 4 by 100 meter relay. Uh, honor roll student pursuing a master's degree in higher education. I mean, this guy's – and then if you watch him, and you saw this year for Virginia. Virginia was not a good team this year, but man, this guy was everywhere. I mean, he may he his bad game was like nine catches for ninety one yards and a touchdown. I mean, this guy had huge stats all year long. Um, have you seen Malik Washington at all from Virginia? And 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 I guess more importantly, can a five eight receiver, you know, succeed? in the NFL to the point where you would take him on day two? Uh, I mean, to me, you've got a better shot in a Kyle Shanahan. You just have a better shot with coaches who know how to get you into space. I don't know. How, how did they use him, Larry? Like, was he, was he running end arounds? Well, he did He did a little bit of everything. I mean, literally, they they ran him on cross, short crossers across the middle of the field. They ran him on, on hitches. Uh, they ran him on downfield routes. Um, he's quick. He's, he's a little bit more powerful than you think. Um, he, he kind of has a Tyreek Hill vibe without that explosive speed. He's not quite as – he's not the speedster that Tyreek is, but he's got the same body type. He's thick. He's powerful. He's explosive in short areas. I mean, I'm, I'm just interested in, in good player. You think – if you think he's a – you think he's a second or third round pick at 5'8"? I think he's a late third, probably early fourth round pick. I mean, I, I would Does like he to return. Get him. He, he can return. Yeah, he can do okay. some returning. Um, I, I, I just think yeah, he's one of those guys that he's just very productive, very, uh, very mature, um, you know, carries, you know, runs the runs the routes correctly, um, you know, really good at using your movement against you. Um, he, he's good. I mean, I mean, he's, yeah. Joey Nichols says he's nowhere close to Tyreek, but he's a good player. No, he's not, he's not Tyreek, but he's built like Tyreek. He's got the Tyreek exact. I mean, if you want to say what's he built like, he's exactly Tyreek. Uh, but he doesn't have that kind of 
ridiculous speed. He's more of a moderate speed guy, but he's very quick in a short area and he's incredibly productive. And it's not like the guy played for, you know, some tiny little division three thing. He played in the ACC and he did it against some, some top tier guys. I really like him quite a bit. The other guy I wanted to ask you about was McCaffrey's brother. I mean, what do you think of McCaffrey's brother? Two years ago, he's a quarterback. Last year, he was a receiver for the first time, and he had a bust-out year. He ran a 4-4-7. He's got pretty good size. Uh, when you watch him, though, there's something kind of underwhelming about his movement. It's like, is he really faster than Christian? I don't know. I mean, he he was for the stopwatch but I don't know if he actually is as field fast as Christian. He, to me, he looked, he looked good, but not great. He looked, you know, dependable, but not special. Um, have you looked at McCaffrey's brother at all? Yeah. And I've, and I've, you know, I've watched all the McCaffrey's as most of us have. I love the idea of converted quarterbacks at safety at receiver at linebacker. Sometimes you get a linebacker that's a converted quarterback but you often get them at safety um and i really like him at receiver just generally speaking i'm intrigued by him he does not look faster than christian to me but christian also looks like he has you know taken a lot of um track instruction in his running right when you watch christian run you see a person who appears to have worked on their technique with this, it in a, in a way that's great and he looked like this back in college too christian ran from a form standpoint this way back in college. Um, and it's efficient. Now Christian doesn't really run away, right? When it comes to like runaway touchdowns, unless there's a significant gap. He did in college, not as much in the NFL with the Niners. Um, I'm intrigued by him, but you know, to me, like this would be a low, this would have, to, I, I wouldn't take him on, you know, six, seventh round, six round. I mean, I don't know where he's, I haven't looked lately where he's projected but that feels about right. Doesn't it seventh round undrafted? Are you talking about Luke? Yeah. Um, they're saying he might come up. There's a lot of teams that like him and he may come off the board, uh, end of the third or beginning of the fourth. That, that seems, that seems like an overdraft. Doesn't that seem unlikely to you? <laughs> when I first saw him, I thought, you know what? This guy's like a six round pick. Um, and I usually go with my first instincts. And now I've watched him a little bit and I think, yeah, maybe a late fifth, but I've heard talk that there's, that he's very popular among NFL personnel people and that he may come off the board earlier. Um, to me, I would say the fifth round is the sweet spot there. The other, the other question the guy, I think, which, kinda... which by the way, Larry, if, if they draft him the fifth round, that might make him the second receiver they take. So if, if that's the case, that's fine to me. Yeah. Yeah. And then there, then there's the question of how many receivers can you possibly have on your roster? You have Debo and IU and JJ, you have Ronnie bell. You have, you know, they have uh Tay Martin, they have Danny gray. I mean, are, are they, you know, are these guys are, you know, here's the other question I would say too, is that the receiver market. And this is the, the thing. I mean, it's not really about IU cause IU an all pro the best guys get paid. I mean, like Calvin Ridley, you know, whatever, $92 million and, you know, 50 million guaranteed. You know, it's like there's money out there for, for great receivers, but I'm looking at the receiver free agent pool right now, just the receivers. These are the receivers. Now it's granted it's March or it's um, April 2nd. So free agency has come and gone for the most part. These are the receivers that are still on the market. This is a pretty in intriguing group of receivers. Hunter Renfro, Allen Robinson, o OBJ, Michael Gallup, Tyler Boyd, Michael Thomas, MVS, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, Kendrick Bourne, DJ Chark, Jamal Agnew, McCole Hardman, who was traded last year to Kansas City, Jakeem Grant, who might not be a bad ad as a return guy, uh, LaVisca Chenault, who I've always liked, um, no, I, for I, whatever no. reason, hasn't happened for him, but no. he's out there. Marquise Goodwin, Chase Claypool, who they're saying may go to Canada. Uh, I've always liked Claypool. I don't know what the hell happened with that guy. Because well, you, apparently great... you don't hang out with him. 
Yeah, well, yeah, I don't hang out with him. But he had a nice rookie year, and then he just kind of evaporated. Um, And then a couple other guys. I mean, Trent Taylor, Laquan Treadwell. Those guys are just kind of guys. Trey Nixon's not bad, who was with New England. He's 26. Um, But, I mean, that's a decent group of of wide receivers that you could just sign off the street today if you didn't want to draft one. But I think they want to draft one. They do it every year. Yeah. They do it every year. I mean, they've drafted nine receivers in seven drafts. So they want to draft a receiver, Larry. They like doing it. Now, now they might do it in the seventh round, right? They did. Ronnie Bell was in the seventh. John Jennings was in the seventh. They get, they actually have a pretty good eye for seventh round receivers. So that I might do. be their, that, you know, that might be where they do it. That might be the second guy they take. I think they're taking a guy earlier than that though. But I, you know, um, I would not be in a rush on any of those guys you named because you, you, you are paying for, 15 catches to 25 right. catches, right? That's what you're paying for. When or it's almost like an insurance policy. Unless you had a guy. I just, I don't want to pay for you thought was a return man. Like Jakeem Grant is an interesting name. He's not a great player, but Jakeem Grant is a very good returner. And if you wanted to have a, a you know, a, a lightning quick return man, I don't know about his health, but uh, if he was healthy, I'd be interested in him. I, you know, I, I still, what are these returns going to look like? I mean, I would imagine they're studying the XFL, but yeah, I mean, I hope they're studying. You watched them like there are these returns were a mess from a blocking really? standpoint. Well, it's just nothing. Nobody, there's zero creativity. And I don't right. know if because the coaches don't have it or they didn't have enough time for it or you just can't do it. But like, rarely did you see from, from, I just watched like a, somebody put together like clips of all these, it's like occasionally you'd see like a pulling, a pull block, right? But mostly it's like dudes blocking one on one and it's just chaos. Yeah, chaos. So yeah. I don't I don't exactly know what it is we're gonna get here. Um, unless you feel like you know, and maybe some of these guys do feel like they know. Uh, and I would imagine like they're getting on the phone with guys who coach in the XFL to ask them. Um I don't know. I I wouldn't make I wouldn't spend too much money on a return guy before I even know exactly what kind of return guy I need. Um, you know, it's funny. I'm I'm I was just scouring the internet before this morning before the show, and there was an article out by somebody named Chris Parti from Yard Barker, four potential landing spots for Brandon Ayuk. Um, okay. and I, you know, it's like these were you know, they list the Steelers, the Commanders, the Texans, and the Jaguars. Uh, as potential homes for Brandon Ayuk. The one thing I would say about kind of, you know, dovetailing our previous thought, I could see if you're in the market for Brandon Ayuk or any veteran wide receiver, it's probably because you've got job security issues, you know? Um, and, And I say that because... It just seems like you could draft the best receiver in the game. You could in the draft, right, and right. yet you may have to wait three years. Um, where if you get Brandon Ayuk in a trade, you know you're getting a great player right away. Now he's you're getting a great player who doesn't know your system, but you're getting a great player. I just think of like Jacksonville and Pittsburgh as, you know, I mean Trent Baalke may be fired if they don't go to the playoffs this year. I don't know. Uh, maybe he's willing to make a trade because of that. You know, Mike Tomlin, I think, has got to win um, in in Pittsburgh. I know he's been a winner, but he hasn't won in the playoffs in five years. Um, you know, that they're interested is not a shocker to me. So it, it, it's when I see these teams, Houston, I don't know. I mean, D'Amico is going to be there a while. Obviously, Washington's a brand new regime. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. But I would say the real attraction of an IU is that, you know, you're getting a guy this year. You yeah. can play. Yeah, I saw, I heard, uh, I don't know if you heard Doug, Doug Peterson at the uh, league meetings, the owners meet, whatever, the league meetings the other day. I heard an interview that he did where he's like, you know, they have the next step for, for Trevor Lawrence. It's just like in the big moments to make the right plays. It's like, God, that's kind of a guy. If that's the question you have about him, that's kind of a major question to have about this guy. Uh, they've invested in receiver for him. I agree with you. I mean, like the team that always quote unquote made the most sense, even though it makes no sense was the jets. Like, would they do something desperate at 10 right now? The idea that someone's going to offer you the 10th pick for Brandon, Ayuk feels pretty insane, but that's the point. It's like, 
the Niners would have to get their socks blown off and somebody would have to be a little irrational to offer them a pick that feels that special, right? Like that Jags thing. Remember that Jags rumor, whatever the hell that was a few weeks ago? And it was like the 17th pick and Zay Jones. The, The reason whoever came up with that idea included Zay Jones wasn't because the Niners have like some desire for Zay Jones. It was because the Jags were saying, save us $6 million and take Zay, or whatever the number was, take Zay Jones if you're getting the 17th pick, right? Uh, that's my theory on that whole thing. Zay Jones yeah, wasn't I mean, included. It seemed like, random. It seemed really it was random. random. But, like, my point is just that 17 and Zay Jones, like, you don't, if you offer 17 for Brandon Ayuk, tell me if you agree with this, you don't have to add more. Like, 17 is a hell of an offer for Brandon Ayuk, Right. Yeah, I, I I mean personally that's a, that's a more than fair offer for Brandon Ayuk. You don't have to add players. I, I I hear you, but at the same time, there's a bust rate. Of course, I wouldn't take it. Choices. I'm just saying based on what receivers get traded for, Larry. Yeah, yeah, right. Seventeen is a very fair offer based on what the market is. Yeah, I just you know my whole thing is it's kind of like the Buckner with the Kinlaw thing. It's like yeah, you know yeah. uh, that you know you're getting Buckner. You know what Buckner is. You know, the Niners are getting the pick and they took Kinlaw with it. Well, they don't know. And there's a bust rate or there's a, you know, there's a rate where, um, you know, somebody says, Larry, DR says, Larry thinks uh, Ayuk is worth a top five pick. No, I don't. I'm just saying I, I personally would want a two for one in any situation. When I'm trying a vet, trading a veteran player that's producing and good, and you're giving me a draft pick, I want two draft picks. Why? Because there's a bust rate. There's a there's a there's a miss rate on the draft picks. You're yeah, yes, you could get Brandon Ayuk at 17, or you could miss. So it's like, and I'm trading you a sure thing. So all I'm saying is I would like a two for one. I would like at least two picks for one, two bites of the apple if I'm giving you a guaranteed thing. Now it doesn't have to be two high picks it could be one high pick one low pick but i just want two picks that's just me yeah uh, i mean of course I, but larry if if i'm offering you 17 i am not offering you another pick like that's a hell of a value right but if you're offering me 17 for an established receiver you, odds are you need that established receiver to produce for you next right. year for a reason right. and there's only so many of them so to say hey i'll take your seventh round pick or sixth round pick in addition may not be a deal breaker but I, that's what i would ask for yeah, i would want fine. a 17 and like a a late a day late day three pick just so i could have one more chance to find a replacement you know i mean that's really what it is you're trying to find a replacement and i wouldn't trade him for 17 understand I, i'm with i yeah. agree with you but i just when you look at like tyree when you look at these trades History says that Brad Ayuk is not going to get you the twelfth, the thirteenth pick in the draft. You know, he's no, just not. No, a lot of times people would say, "Hey, if you got a late first, that would be good." All right, let's talk about another position. I want to get your thoughts on safety. Where are you with the 49ers at safety? I mean, they've got uh, Talanoa Afanga and they've got uh, Jair Brown, but Afanga's coming off. Um, you know, an injury and he was injured a ton in college and Jair Brown is a, is a second year player. They're probably both better at strong safety than free safety, but um, where are you with their safeties? I mean, they've been talking to just uh, to Julian Blackman. You know, there's talk that John Lynch may bring back uh, Tayshawn Gibson. who I'm not a huge fan of just because Gibson to me will catch interceptions but he's not great and against the run and he's not great against the pass. And so the, I don't love him, but I'm looking at that safety spot and I'm thinking Fonga's hurt. We don't know about Brown exactly. And then it's a very physical position. The rest of your guys, George Odom's a special teamer. The other two guys are, are more just kind of stopgap uh, replacement level players, you know, practice squad guys. What do you think? Do the Niners need to sign a safety uh, before before camp starts, and you know, do you have do you have any you know thoughts on on potentially what could be out there for them? I mean, I I, I do like Julian Blackman. 
um, going back to college, right? He he is like a he's one of these prototypical Utah defensive backs. Um, but I don't think like you're not drafting that spot with any expectation that you're going to get help right away, right? This year, so even though it's not ideal. I think some combination of Brown, Hufunga, and Gibson can get you through the year. Um, it's not ideal. It's not the first option. But I think if you've got those three guys playing safety for you, you have professional NFL safeties. And you've got Mooney Ward. Maybe you're drafting a corner, right? Maybe you're not. But you got Mooney Ward. You got Lenore. You got an all-pro linebacker. Hopefully you got a better pass rush. And you just get you get through the year with a guy that's been a pro bowler and another guy that might be, but maybe he's not. Um, it's it's kind of weird, really, Larry, right now, the situation they find themselves in, because it felt like at one point, you know, Hufunga was an all pro. And I I talked to my buddy, Will Blackman, a while back on the channel, and he's like, people do not understand how good this guy, like this guy is all that. And then other people kind of think like, yeah, it was... He's an all, he wasn't all pro, but is he really, he's not Ed Reed and all pro. Right. Um, and there, there feels like there's a redundancy with him and Brown skill sets that makes you wonder if Jair Brown was actually here to replace Hufunga, not play alongside him. Right. Like they don't feel like they don't feel complimentary. Really. It's not Cam Chancellor and Earl Thomas, but that said, Hufunga is a hell of a player. Jair Brown's a hell of an athlete. He's got a shot. So if you had to play the two of them together this year, I'd be into it. Like, I'd be okay with it, even though I don't think it exactly fits. But I'd be okay with it because I think they're both good players. You know what I mean? Um, and I don't really know what your other options are. I guess you could, if you go Julian Blackman, fine. And then maybe he and Brown replace Hufunga eventually. But maybe Talanoa comes back and has a great year. I mean, that's very possible, right? He He had an injury that, he should be able to bounce back from. And he never really was. It wasn't about his speed. It was about his brain, his anticipation. So he should come back from injury, I think, as a good player still. But that, that's, know, where I, that's where I'm at with them. That's where I'm at with look, them. Looking at the safety free agents guy, I mean, Jamal Adams, Justin Simmons, uh, Eddie Jackson, Quandre Diggs. I like Quandre Diggs quite a bit. Uh, Micah Hyde, Tracy Walker, Marcus May, J. Ron Curse, uh, Adrian Phillips, Tayshawn Gibson. If you go further down the line, uh, you got guys like um, uh, who else is interesting on this list? Uh, well, Julian Blackman, of course. And and um, you know, is there is there any safety on the J. Ron Curse is a kind of an interesting name. What, what do you, is there any of those veteran safeties that you look at and say, because I'm not a big fan of, of Tayshawn Gibson. I just don't think Tayshawn Gibson plays tight coverage. And then I, I watch him as a, as a run fit guy and he just doesn't always take the right, the right run fit. So it's like, okay, he's, he can give up big plays against the run. He's not a great cover guy. So what does he give you? He gives you like, if you overthrow a pass and it's just lofting in the middle of the field or gets tipped. He's got a great knack to pick it off. I think the guy's got like 36 or 37 career interceptions. Um, but other than that, and I understand why on the tail end of Ward and Tart, they they were attracted to high productive interceptors. But to me, you got to do something more than just be a high productive interceptor at safety. I think Gibson's one of the reasons the Niners weren't very good against the run. Are you saying you don't want him as like safety three or, or would you would not want him? Like that's, that's how I think of him. Well, I mean, I, I just think if he comes back, he's going to be safety two. Okay. And, Cause Odom is safety three and your special yeah, teams. Guy. I mean, Odom's a special teamer. I don't, I don't think if, if they had to start Odom from scrimmage, I think they would be looking for somebody off the street. Um, so wait, I just, what do you think of Hufanga and Brown together? I mean, I like Hufanga, but Hufanga um, wasn't healthy in college and is proving not to be healthy in the pros. And I think he falls off tackles. I My son did have a stat a couple of weeks ago that was amazing, that the Niners were amazing against the run pre-Hufanga's injury. And then after the Hufanga injury, they dropped precipitously against the run. He's really good at attacking the mesh point. He's really smart 
uh, understanding when to play, you know, run or pass. I just see him as a liability in coverage and a guy who falls off blocks at the line of scrimmage. He just, to me, he seems like a, even if you don't love him, a pretty good option given the position they're in right now. Yeah. I mean, he, if he's, he's healthy. Your, he's good. Yeah, yeah, if he's healthy. But I don't think there's, is there, do you have much? I mean, I guess, you know, until you're proven healthy, you're unhealthy, but the timeline should line up pretty well for him to come back and be healthy. But I, I just wonder if they, if they were, kind of already planning to replace him. Well, and if they do replace him, you know, this is a decent draft to replace him in. And, and this, I'm really glad we have you here because I know how, how much you watch the PAC 12. Many of the top safety guys are PAC 12 guys. Let me throw a few of them your way. You yeah, tell give, me, give me the list. Um, you know, these are the PAC 12 safeties that, that are really, you know, I think viable for the Niners. There's Cole Bishop. Yes. Utah. That's the guy. There's Taylor number one. You like Cole Bishop. I love Cole Bishop. There's Kalen Bullock from uh, SC. SC. There's Jaden Hicks from Wazoo. Um, really good player. There's Katan yeah. Oladapo from Oregon State. Yeah. Who's got kind of the, the bleach top. He kind of bleached the top of his hair. He, he is intriguing <laughs> to me. There's Evan Williams from Oregon. That's your scouting report. He bleaches the top <laughs> well, of his hair. I remember him. Um, who else? You, who did you just say? Evan Williams from Oregon. Oh, Fresno State. Transfer. Uh, Patrick McMorris from Cal. Who was uh, a transfer from San Diego State? Who else is not? Oh, here's a guy that I know the Niners have looked at. They've looked at uh, the combo safety running back from Utah, Sione Vaki. Vaki. Yeah. Vaki, two years ago, he was a running back and got forced into action in the Rose Bowl to play corner and played okay. Um, he's a good player. They last year they had some uh running back injuries and uh made him a running back like the week of a game, and I think he went for over 100 yards. So maybe he could return. I got to go back and look at his game log, but he's a he's interesting. And then I was telling you before the show that the guy that really stands out to me is um, Jamal is Hill. Jamal Hill from uh from Oregon who. Six feet, 225, you know, he's is he a linebacker? Is he a safety? But, man, you looked at that workout. I mean, the guy ran 4'4". Four, four. He had a 40-inch vertical. He made one of the most amazing interceptions of the year. I probably think he's more of a linebacker than a safety. But um, I, I, there's no doubt I'd want to draft him. Jamal Hill, I mean, anybody go watch that guy. That guy's – he wore 19 for Oregon. He's just a just a monster. I mean, this guy's a big time hitter. He's 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 really 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 physical. He's fast. Phys- has some dominant traits and kind of plays with a swagger. Um, of those Pac-12 safeties, who do you like? Uh, I love Paul Bishop. Really? Yeah. Tell us what you love about Bishop. Well, he's he's been a guy that's he kind of played right away for them. He's physical. He's fast. Um, he is a. Uh, you know, I think to play safety for Kyle Whittingham requires a lot intellectually. They've had they've done it before there where they've moved quarterbacks to safety just because they ask a lot. And he's a guy that was an instant impact on keep in mind on really good defenses, right? Like he showed up at Utah at a time when uh they had a bunch of star players, like first round picks and multiple levels of their defenses, cornerbacks, linebacker, pass rusher. And he played basically right away for them. I think he's from uh Peach Tree City, Georgia, which is the uh, golf cart capital <laughs> of the world, or at least of America. They've got like uh, their whole town has like uh, bike paths everywhere where people just drive their gar- golf carts. Um, Sounds nice. So I like him. Uh, Katan Oladapo from Oregon State, I like. He's really just, uh, he's a physical presence. I, I'm looking at him listed at 6'1. He's a big dude. Um, and again, like, if you're drafting defensive players from Oregon State or Utah, what you know you're getting is physical players, tough-minded, smart, physical players. So uh, he fits in that. He fits in that category. Really, all of those guys you listed, Larry, were for the most part were pretty productive. I thought, I I thought Patrick McMorris would come out of this year as like a top three round guy, and I don't. That didn't exactly happen. Um, Evan Williams is a solid player. 
not uber fast, but again, like super smart, right? Playing for Dan Lanning. Uh, so like all those guys were really productive players. They played in a league that threw the ball a lot, but also had excellent running backs. The last year, the Pac-12 was highlighted as the year that, you know, Washington went to the playoff, went to the championship game. But I think one thing that really happened in the league was you had a, a bunch of really good quarterbacks and a bunch of really good running backs. So to play defense in the league required you to stop the run and stop the pass. So all these safeties, I think, come in having seen physical run games and dynamic pass games, good quarterbacks. So that's a list of really good safeties. Um, that's a list of really good safeties. Like it was Faki also intrigues me just because of the way he played last year. Like he, they just plugged him in at running back. He played running back. So yeah, those it, it, think about Lanning, Oregon state, Utah, uh, USC is not known for its physicality on defense. So Kalen Bullock, but you know, several of the guys you listed came from really physical, really physical programs. Um, and most of them had to tackle. Most of them had to tackle. What do you think of this one? T-dubs is Vaki's better at running back. He, Maybe that's why know, you draft him. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he figured he's, out. He's a, he's a combo. There's no question he's a combo player. Um, what is the Niners' primary need? If you said going into oh. this draft is, I mean, people would say, oh, it's offensive tackle, but they, yeah. it's pretty obvious that Kyle Shanahan, you know, loves Trent Williams and really likes Colton McKivitz and they're looking for more help, but it doesn't sound like they're looking for a plug and play guy and then um, defensive tackle, but they just signed a couple guys um, corner, but they're, you know, six, seven deep there. And really, you know, it, it, you know, I don't know how it's kind of, it's kind of debatable how how prime you know premier the or at least how primary I should say the um, the that position is. What about linebacker? What do you think? I mean, is linebacker the biggest need? I mean, they signed Devondre Campbell, but they're not going to have Dre Greenlaw. Um, I'm looking at some at the mock draft simulator. At 31, they could be staring at Edger and Cooper, who's phenomenal from A and M. Peyton Wilson from NC State, who had you know, he's the Bolitnikoff Award winner this year, and he had a crazy workout. I mean, just an amazing workout, but there's injury concerns. I love Cedric Gray from North Carolina a ton. To me, uh, he's a he's a lock to be really good. Jeremiah Trotter from Clemson, very, very productive player. I mean, they may be staring at the best linebackers in the in the draft at 31. Do they dare draft one there? What do you think? I, I I, I think they should dare. I'm not saying they, they should do it, but I would be open to it. Like, I do think offensive line is a big need. I, I do think you can get a good offensive line at 31. But if you don't think he can plug and play this year, then it may not be worth doing. Uh, at the I, I did this yesterday on my show, Larry, but uh, I'd like your reaction to it. In the last 25 drafts, going back to 1999, last 25 drafts, the last five picks of the first round is what I looked at. So the range that the Niners are in, right? Picks 28, 29, 30, 31, 30, 29, 30, 31, 32. Yeah, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. 14 offensive linemen have been drafted in those spots in the last 25 drafts, 14 total. Three of them became all pros. Half of them became good players for their team. So it's 50-50 that you're getting a good offensive lineman in the last yeah. 25 years in that spot. Not great. Not great if you're and looking for a year, play guy. This year, there's so such a such a um, you know the quality of offensive line play in the NFL has has declined to such a point where I think that there may be teams reaching for offensive linemen in this draft. That may be even a bigger number this year of people kind of taking a swing at an offensive lineman. But it it kind of speaks to the need and the difficulty in evaluating those players. Yeah, but there's also difficulty in evaluating corners. Yeah. In this area, because I do think that's a need. Like you said, there's a lot of guys, but there's a lot of guys that you're comfortable with coming off the bench, right? Unless you, uh, uh, Yadam, do you like Isaac Yadam? We haven't, you and I haven't talked about him. I do actually like him. I, I, you know, I liked him before he went to the Saints. And then this year, he had a really good year at the, with the Saints. He was at Boston College. He's a long, tall corner. I think he'll compete uh, for a spot. I, I, I like him as a, 
I think he's kind of an underrated free agent pickup, you know, since they got him at kind of a cheap price too. I saw somebody in the chat said uh, Demerson, Texas Tech, Dejeron Taylor Demerson. Who I watched, I, like I watched his film, and you know, all I would say was hyperactive tackler. I mean, that guy's just everywhere. He plays super fast. He's not the biggest. He's more of a grab and drag type tackler. He's not a thumper. He's not going to hit you, and you're just down. But he's so freaking active. And he's so he was, hyperactive. I mean, it's amazing how his energy is off the charts. Yeah, he was the key to their defense. When he got hurt at the end of the year, it affected them on defense. Like, he's a, he's a very good player. Uh, so that's another guy. Like, But he's old. You know, like, you, you might be drafted a fifth-year senior <laughs> in this draft. Like, I don't love that idea right early. Um, but anyway, the, I say all that to say corner is – like I'd be open to a corner. If you said, if you said to me, the 49ers are, if you said Larry Kruger is reporting, the 49ers have decided they're going to go BPA at the end of the first round, best player available. What positions should be in their box where they would go BPA, right? Offensive line, linebacker, safety. I would put linebacker in the category of like who should be in their BPA box there. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm in this mode now where forget BPA. I would want to target. I like the way that Brad Holmes and the Lions are doing it. I get the feeling when I'm watching their war room that they have a small board and that they're targeting certain players that they really, really love, and then yeah. they're going after those players. Brian Branch, uh, Jameer Gibbs the tight end from Iowa, all these guys feel like, you know, we, we don't just want a tight end and we'll take the best guy on the board and fill a need. We want that guy. And if we don't get that guy, then we, we, we don't even want this position. Maybe we'll go in a different direction. So it's, it's, it's like BPA, but it's your BPA, right? Your board's BPA. I like right. that. Like, like I'll give you an example at corner. I love Max Melton from Rutgers, right? He's smart. He's tough. He's physical. He ran in the four threes. Uh, if you watch him against the run, he'll step up and start you. I mean, he's a big hitting corner who runs four, three, who's smart, comes from a football family. His brother plays for the pack. Um, you know, I mean, he's, he's a, he, to me, Max Melton is a, is a really, really good draft choice. Well, he's projected to go in like the 50s or 60s or maybe in the 40s and the Niners pick at 31. Well, if you love them, take them, you know, um, that would be, you know, that's a guy like if that, you know, I don't want any corner. It's not like I want, I just need to have a top corner. I want, a, you know, I'd hand pick like a half dozen guys that I Cooper absolutely DeGene. love. Cooper DeJean. Cooper DeJean is from, from Iowa, who's a, is he a corner? Is he a safety? You know, he's a returner. He's 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 a football player. You know, a lot of people really really like him and think he's a real talent. Um, couple thoughts here before we finish up. There is. This is now we now have a pretty good track record of the Shanahan Lynch combo drafting. Mm -hmm. um, it started in 20, 2017 with that disastrous draft of. Solomon Thomas over Mahomes and Watson, and then Reuben Foster at the end of round one, followed by Akella Witherspoon, C.J. Beathard, Joe Williams. It wasn't even the best Williams running back in that draft from the state of Utah. They took Joe Williams. I I, I Wait, saw it come across the, the board at the who's time. Who's the best state of Utah Williams running back? Well, it was Jamal Williams. Oh. And and you know, I saw it come across the board, and I'm like, ah. Oh, Jay Williams. Oh, the Niners got Jamal Williams from BYU. BYU. I really like that yeah. kid. I'd interviewed him before the draft. I'm like, hey, Jamal Williams, that's not bad. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I'm here. Oh, no, it's Joe Williams. <laughs> I'm like, what? But they got Kittle in that draft, and they did get DJ Jones, and that's kind of saved that whole draft. Right. Um, but that was a bad draft. Okay, so then that's 2017. 2018, they reach for McGlinchey at nine overall. He's a right tackle. Um, and then they go Dante Pettis in round two bust, but they did find Fred Warner in the third round, by the way, and... draft McGlinchey ahead of Colton Miller. What's that? The, yeah. McGlin Colton Miller goes after McGlinchey. I think has to be um, mentioned. Yeah. Bad draft though. Another bad draft. 
Harvarius Moore, Kentavious Street, DJ Reed got out of there. Marcel Harris, Julian Taylor, Richie James. I mean, what did you get? You got Fred. Ta you got Fred Warner. Good player, but that's basically your entire draft. That was 2018. Right. 2019 was their best draft. Right. They had both Sun Debo uh, one two. Then they missed on Jalen Hurd in the third round, but they got Wishnowski. They got Greenlaw in the fifth round. Um, so that wasn't bad. Uh, that's a pretty good draft. Bosa, Debo, Greenlaw, Wishnowski. You got four starters, uh, you know, some some Pro Bowl caliber players. Then 2020, they they make the Buckner trade. They draft Kinlaw. That wasn't a good pick, but they did get Ayuk at, tw at uh, 25. They took Colton McKivitz, Charlie Warner, and they got Jawan Jennings in the seventh round. So even though they only had five picks uh, and they missed on the first, you know, I, it wasn't horrible. Then the Charlie Charlie Warner played 65 games. I mean, he played every game basically for four years for a six-round yeah. pick. That's pretty good. That's not bad. Then the 2021 draft is also kind of a circus because they traded up for Trey Lance. Uh, Trey Lance became a bust. They did get Aaron Banks out of it. They did get Aaron, uh, Ambry Thomas out of it. They did get Demo Lenore and Afonga and Elijah Mitchell all on day three <laughs> with Jalen Moore. So that's actually a, even though Lance was a whiff and Trey Sermon was a third round whiff, they did okay in the rest of that draft. I mean, they, those are, that's a pretty good rest of the draft. They just whiffed on Lance. Um, and then there's 2022. They have Drake Jackson. To this point, a bust. TDP, no longer with them. Danny Gray, this point, a bust. Spencer Burford, I don't know what you'd say about him. Womack, I like. They got Nick Sakel. And, but then, of course, what saves this draft is they got Brock Purdy in the seventh round. So, bad draft, but Purdy in the seventh is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Burford's gone. I mean, if you said in this draft, the Niners are going to get in the fourth round, an offensive lineman that plays basically every game for the next two years, you'd be like, oh, probably solid. And I'm like, well, but he only plays like half of every game. Like, oh, that's weird. Uh, so, And then this this last yeah, year. Just what I would say about Spencer right. Burford is like really has served a purpose, but also should not be just anchored at that position is, is you know, you should be trying to upgrade him as well. Or he upgrades himself, but not, not bad. He's had I mean, a little bit of an inconsistent um, – you know, football card. I mean, he was good as a rookie. He wasn't as good as a second year player. We'll see what he is as a third year player. Yeah. Yeah. TBD. Um, and, and then this last year, Jair Brown in the third round, they didn't pick till the third round, but they got Jair Brown. They got Jake Moody, Cam Latou, Darrell Luter, Robert Beal, D winters, Braden Willis, Ronnie Bell, Jalen Graham. There's some players in there. I like Jalen Graham. Um, I like Luter. Moody's your kicker. Jair Brown is a pretty good, pretty damn good safety. Whether, you know, what, what position he settles in on strong or free, we'll see. But I mean, decent draft. But I overall, know. what would I you think so? Larry, you I, know, I think the 23 know. draft, it could go either way right now. But if we did kind of trend arrows on every one of the players in that draft, like it's not like two are trending up. Moody and Brown, Jair, Latu's not, Luter, uh, everyone talks about it, but we'll see. Beal, again, it's early. Like, you, these are fifth, the half of this draft is day three. More than half of this draft is day three, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven of the 10 guys, 70% of this draft is day, is Saturday. So it's it's unfair to them. Like Ronnie Bell, that's a fan. it's been a really good seventh round pick so far. For what a seventh round pick is. If a seventh round pick might be one of your top four or five receivers, that's that's fine. But we so may what, look they may overall, get right now it's know. trending towards two starters out of that draft, which okay. Should the Niner fans have confidence in Lynch and their drafting? I mean, we don't one, we don't know how much of that was Adam Peters, how much of that was Lynch, how much of that was Shanahan, how much of that was Rand Carthon, how much of that was, you know, Tariq Ahmad or any of their scouts or whatever. We don't know. Uh, we don't know who's banging the table for who. Was it coaches involved? Um, you know, Steve Wilkes, when you watch the video of 
this last draft seemed to be really hyped for some of their picks. Like he maybe had a, a big say in some of the, some of the selections. Uh, I don't know though that for sure, but I mean, how do you feel about the Niners ability to draft? Uh, because they, I mean, if you just take, if you just take their first two picks, let's say in every draft, Solomon Thomas, Ruben Foster, Mike McGlinchey, Dante Pettis, Nick Bosa, Debo Samuel, Javon Kinlaw, Brandon Ayuk, Trey Lance, Aaron Banks, Drake Jackson, Ty Davis Price, Jair Brown, Jake Moody. Do you see what I'm saying there? It's like there's you got you got Brown and you got Banks and you got Ayuk, you got Bosa and Debo, and that's it. You got five. You know, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven drafts. And in the first two picks, you've got five good players. And and you had 14 picks in those seven drafts in the first the first two. I don't know. It seems it seems like a it seems like if they're going to be competitive with these Lions and, and Packers and all the best teams in the NFC and the teams that are getting better their hit rate has got to be dialed up a little bit better than what it's been. Well, is that being too critical or do you think that's, no, I, I don't think that's critical. I, I do have confidence in them, but I don't think that's too critical. Um, I also think if you, if we look at like some of those names you just mentioned that didn't work, right. Trey Jackson, Trey Lance, Javon Kinlaw. Uh, those three stand out to me as guys who, or our, our projection well, and Drake, there's still time for him, but um, you know, he was kind of a, let's take a shot on a projection in the second round. It almost feels on a few of these guys. Well, actually what I was about to say probably wasn't fair, but um, yeah, like it makes you wonder, should they emphasize college productivity with their first pick this year? That's what, that's my kind of snap judgment reaction. Should it be an emphasis on, college productivity. And if you're saying and eh, none of these offensive linemen at 31 are going to plug and play. So you're talking about development. Don't love that then. Right. Like if they're drafting an offensive lineman at 31, like I want that guy to play. Like I want them to think he's good enough to play now because they need their offensive line to be better. If it's not going to make their offensive line better this year, go somewhere else, make your team better this year with that first pick. That's because I, I think that that offensive line draft thing I gave you earlier, Looking at it yesterday, one of my conclusions was the way you're going to replace Trent Williams is probably just with a, a real – you might have to spend a ton of money to replace Trent Williams or a ton of draft capital to replace Trent Williams. You just you may not be replacing him with the 31st pick in the draft or a second or a third-round pick, right? That's a, that's a hard ask. So maybe that's not what you're trying to do here. You're just trying to plug in a guy that can play, and you'll worry about replacing Trent later as opposed to – uh, let's get a guy, develop him. Maybe he can become Trent. Like that, that might be too small of a of a target that you're trying to hit. So that that's my take. That's so like going through it. My first reaction is maybe you need to emphasize college productivity early. Now, part of this too, right, is like it's tough. All these picks are not equal. Jair Brown was a third rounder. Drake Jackson was 61, like the end of the second round. So they've, you know, sometimes their first picks have not, they're not top. 15 picks. The one that was, was Kinlaw and, and McGlinchey. And, you know, Kinlaw was a miss. McGlinchey was a starter on a, you know, Super Bowl team, but not what you would have wanted. So all that said, I, they do find good players. They do. They've consistently found good players. Just not in the spots necessarily where you think they will. Um, Interesting report I'm just seeing now on mm -hmm. Niners Nation it says the 49ers had interest had interest in former Bengals free agent wide receiver Tyler Boyd, and he says and says potential. But this is a Kyle Posey article. Potential backup plan for Jawan Jennings? Question mark. Um, what do you think of Tyler Boyd? Now he hasn't signed yet, from what I can tell. Um, does that does that give you any indication? Uh, if you know, 
there's teams that are interested. He's a, he's he's still a free agent. He could he you know according to Kyle Posey, he could still be a valuable addition to the Niners. He would serve as a re- reliable plan B if Jawan Jennings were to sign an offer sheet elsewhere. While it's uncertain if the two could coexist in this offense as both players excel in the slot, Boyd's potential signing offers a reassuring backup plan for the team. We kind of hit on this before that the crop of free agent wide receivers that's still available here in early April is kind of an impressive group. Um, What do you think? Tyler Boyd, in a lot of ways, always kind of hung in the background behind Jamar Chase and T. Higgins, but man, when the game started, he was always really, really valuable. You know what I mean? It's like nobody talks Tyler Boyd until all of a sudden it's game day. And it's like, you got to cover this guy. I would be all about that. If they could get a, if they could get a Tyler Boyd to now, I don't know that he compliments the rest of the receiving core, but it does make you think if they went for a Tyler Boyd, or, or I guess I'll ask you, what do you think when you hear the Niners have or had interest in Tyler Boyd, does that make you think that there's going to be a receiver trade that they're preparing for, uh, you know, some kind of Jawan Jennings departure, or is that just, Hey, you know what? Damn good receiver out there who, with good ball skills, get them and, and stack them and, and uh, give yourself more options going into the draft. I don't know. It feels like due diligence, meaning in case Jawan is gone, in case somebody offers us something for Ayuk. Let's get an idea of what's out there and what it would cost. But to me, I don't like I wouldn't sign a contingency plan and then get stuck with that contingency plan when you don't need it financially doesn't make a lot of a ton of sense to me. You know what I mean? Like if you were preparing for what if Juwan leaves, well then there's enough receivers out there that you can just wait till Juwan's gone. Right? He's not leaving. So it feels like due diligence to me. I mean. You know, this is a team that also likes to add players during the year. So you get a chance to meet with a guy. Maybe he comes up, somebody gets hurt. What's our list look like in October? You know, I, like I do think teams do that, right? So um, it feels like due diligence. I don't quite see where he fits in. And to me, like he would be a weird. He had 91 targets last year. That's a lot. He had 67 catch. Why would he come to the 49ers? Like it doesn't make any sense for him. Like you're gonna go. Seems from like targets only to like way he, he's the only way he's a niner, right? Is if they're moving off of one of their top three guys. Yeah. Right. I mean, they're they're not. They wouldn't. Could you see a scenario where they signed him and didn't move off of their no. top three guys? I don't think so. Why? Why would he do that? Unless he felt like the Niners were some uniquely positioned team to win the Super Bowl. Brandon Allen's like. Bro, you got to come. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> sure. Oh, well, yeah, maybe. Yes. Maybe the Brandon Allen factor. I um, guess, but I, I don't. I just, it seems like a weird thing. It does. It, it seems does. like he'd be worth more money to somebody else is the point. Totally. I, yeah, you know. Um, Last one. Colin Cowherd. Do you watch a lot of Cowherd? Uh, yeah. Are you, do you, you, you probably know him, huh? You probably are friends with him. I have friends with, I've met him over the years. Yeah. So Cowherd did this whole soliloquy the other day. And and sometimes I'm like, man, this guy's great. And then other times I'm like, ah, oh, this guy sucks. You know, as far as <laughs> I, I or he'll get like super into his point. The point that he was making the other day, I don't know if you saw this, but his point is that once the Niners sign Brock Purdy to that, to that big money extension, he's making a million bucks or 2 million bucks now. I guess with the uh, adjustment in the cap, uh, that little stipend he got the other day, doubled his salary stipend, 700 something grand. Um, But he basically his point is that once the Niners sign him, that the Niners will become the Cowboys, that they won't be able to compete, that they'll just, they'll, they'll have so much money tied up. Like the Cowboys have tied up in Dak. They'll have all this money tied up in a quarterback. That's good, but can't really get them over the top. They'll have to, you know what I mean? They'll have to, to some, they'll be, they'll be a competitor, but they'll be like on the outside. There'll be a team that makes the playoffs, but they'll be a team that's not really a Super Bowl title contender. What do you think? 
What do you think? Is 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 he onto something there, or is there is he missing something that we're, or am I missing something? Well, I, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, first of all, as always, creative take. Like just from a from an from the aspect, if we're grading the take, good take. Right. He's got the Niners. He's got Brock. He's got the Cowboys. I guess mm, that is a money take right there. Uh, and I understand the logic. I do think there's logic to it. But what I would say to Colin is. I don't think the primary flaw for the Cowboys has been that their quarterback's not good enough. I think the primary flaw for the Cowboys has been that their coach is not good enough. Mm. Like to me, Dak with Kyle Shanahan's a different, a much better player, like, or at least performs better. There's no question that Dak is overpaid, but I don't think his coach is getting the most out of him. And for the, you know, for a good period of time, when you watch the Cowboys, like they have had skilled player talent and good defenses. I think their flaw has been their head coach. So I'm also not convinced yet. We'll see. But the Niners are going to have some leverage. And the 49ers might treat negotiations with Brock more smartly than the Cowboys did with Dak. I think the Cowboys were enamored with the idea of having another one of America's star quarterbacks in Dak. And he's a lovable guy. Um but I'm not convinced that when Brock signs his contract, it'll be the biggest contract for 10 minutes in the NFL for a quarterback. We'll you see. think it's going to be like a step or two beneath that? We'll see. Let's let's. Here's the beauty: we get to play this year out and see what Brock does. We have we have this year, and the Niners will have the leverage on the following year on a player who's made so little money relative to what they could offer him in like the middle of tier one QB money. So I think the primary difference, to summarize my counterpoint, the primary difference is not, uh, the primary difference is the coach. And I think Kyle's a better coach than Mike McCarthy. I think by a wide margin. Especially, the, yeah, go, oh, go good. No, no, that's, that's, that's it. So, so anyway, the point is like, I think he is getting at a very interesting, the interesting question that's got debated last year and will be debated again this year. And we'll be debated again for years and years, unless the 49ers won a Super Bowl soon, which is, is Brock really the kind of guy that deserves the top of the quarterback market money? Is he really a guy that elevates the players around him? Or is he just running an offense more efficiently than most people can, but lacks the ceiling to carry a team? We'll see. I don't know the answer to that yet. I think to act as though we know that he's a carrier. I don't think that's correct. I don't, I don't think we know that he's a carrier. I think he's got to do it more. And I think he's got to do it with uh, a lot on the line. I don't think he has to do it with less, but he has to do it more times uh, for, for me to believe that like, okay, you pay him whatever the top of the market is and he'll take your $7 million receiver. And he's going to, he's going to get that guy 70 balls. We'll see. We'll see the the jury. I'm I am pro Brock. Ah, I am pro Brock. <laughs> the hazards of doing a show like this. I am pro Brock. <laughs> I like him. I like him, even when you remove the money. But we this thing, the jury, it's not over and done yet. Like Dak, we know we've known what he is. Right with Brock, I don't, I don't. We're not exactly sure yet exactly where that ceiling is. So, um, you know, that's what, that's what this year is going to be about, but uh, it's possible. I don't think it's I, like, I, I don't think what he says is crazy. You pay the wrong quarterback. You can't win a championship. I mean, that is, that's true, but the 49ers have a better coach than Dallas. And I think the 49ers also have a better organization. I think Dallas is, you know, run a lot by Jerry and his kid, they listen to their scouts, but they don't listen all the time to their scouts. And so I think their draft record is kind of hit and miss. But as we stated before, the Niner draft record is a little bit of hit and miss. Um, all right, man. Good stream. The, la the last question on the way out the door. I said the last one was the last one, but this is the last one. Is there just non-Niner? I always like to finish with one nine non-Niner question. Um, in the next three weeks, we are going to hear all kinds of dialogue about the top of this draft and the quarterbacks 
Mm-hmm. We're already hearing about it. Caleb Williams, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, Jaden Daniels, Bo Nix, Michael Penix, Spencer Rattler, Michael Pratt, uh, Joe Milton the third. I mean, there's you know Sam Hartman. I mean, there's there's always a lot of talk about quarterbacks. If you could have one quarterback out of this quarterback class, who do you want? Caleb. You you believe in Caleb? Yeah, I, mean, I think he has been uh, without peer when compared to these other guys. I don't I don't think these other guys are in his category. I also like Michael Penix. I like uh, those. That's two my guys. guy. My guy's Penix. I'm going with Penix. I like Penix, but um, you know he ran the sub four five, uh, sub you know sub four four. I mean, I mean, he guy ran fast, and um, and got a huge arm. And he was great this year for Washington. I saw that game against Utah. He just made play after play after play. It seemed like he just kept putting the ball in tight windows from odd trajectories. I will say that, this. That, he was doesn't, by, that was his great. I mean, that was it was great. But that was like everything worked that day. Yeah. I mean, also, there's something really weird about Penix, though, that makes me uncomfortable in that he seems like he throws from odd trajectories for no reason at all. You know, I mean, it's one thing if like, hey, man, they, you were being rushed off your left. You had this linebacker coming off the corner and, you know, you change your arm. He sometimes just looks like he just kind of lowers but, his arm angle and just kind of shoots it out there for without proper mechanics for no reason at all. Yeah, he doesn't and, use his and, lower half. Yeah, he's he's right. really an arm hand freaking monster. Uh, but the the arm speed, the I mean, the ball speed, the, the you know, the. The playmaking lasers. ability, the, you know, I mean, he's just, he is, he's a different thrower of yeah. the football. And yeah, I think you saw it in Indy. Would um, you have the I, guts to take him first, Larry? No, no. But I, I'll say this. Um, I definitely, if you said to me, how many quarterbacks are going in the first round? I don't think there's any doubt. Caleb, Drake, McCarthy, Daniels, Knicks, Penix. I think all six go in the first round. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I do. Do you like Knicks more than Penix? No. Or do you like like Penix Penix more? more. I like Penix more. You do? Yeah. But Knicks is more athletic. Knicks is a more durable player. Like Penix, you know, came as a beat up player to UW and never had an injury really like he did at Indiana. He had multiple ACLs. He had a shoulder injury by the time he got to Washington. But he did get beat up in games, you know, like multiple games would end with him just like <laughs> doubled over. Happened happened multiple times at the end of the year. So, uh, you know, it's not a durability quite. I do wonder, like, is it because he he's he's sneaky athletic, but uh, he got peppered behind a good offensive line. He got hit a few times. You're like, God, that he is in pain. That's a painful position, so maybe it means nothing. Like, he held up. He didn't break a rib. He didn't bust a shoulder. He didn't uh, tear an ACL again or whatever. But uh, And maybe I'm looking at it. Maybe the, the way to look at it is the flip side. Like, he took big hits and kept playing and played well, that sort of thing. Were you a Jaden Daniels man at ASU back I was, in the day? I was, yeah. So you're freshman. not surprised that he went to LSU and lit it up? Um, I was a little surprised in the sense that it kind of felt like I had already been proven wrong at Arizona State. Like, oh, I guess he's not as good as I thought. So I'd kind of give it up. I had I had sold my stock. I'm like, well, all right, I guess I'll sell my stock. And then he, you know, I'm like, I'm like the guy that sold Bitcoin at five thousand. It's like, well, I don't get to claim that I knew it was going to be sixty two, seventy. You know, <laughs> that's right, Bitcoin. All right, guy, good stuff, man. What do you got cooking the rest of your day? Um, you know, I, I I thought you got through the uh, stream with the. <laughs> With the, with the uh, you know the voice uh, still still you know healing up, I thought yeah. it, I thought it went smooth. But what do you got Good. cooking the rest of the day? Well, uh, you know the question is not if I'm going to get through the show; it's whether the person, the people listening to this, will be able to get through it. Uh, that's the question. So uh, I got to get a few things to my tax guy, and I got to uh, maybe go to the. I'm going to play uh, Wenty Went W E N T E tomorrow golf course in uh, Livermore. Supposed to be nice, like a vineyard. My buddy, so my, uh, Townie's, um, you know, Townie well, yeah, of uh, course. Townie's buddy is, is the starter out there. The starter. Uh, What's his name? Yeah. 
Do you remember? I forget his first name. Gosh, okay. I, for, I forget his name. But um, but he's the starter out there, so I mentioned Townie. But also, uh, um, I'll tell you, when to you, it's a, I like the layout. Yeah. You're going to get a lot yeah, of sun. Yeah. There's not a lot of shade on that course. It's a it's a it's a sunny course. It's out in the middle of out in the middle of you know no trees. It's not, it doesn't seem like a lot sun. of trees. I need some sun. Hubert uh, tells me I need some sun. But yeah, I mean, I, I like that course. I even like some of their wines. I, I, I I'll buy their really? wines. That, you know, I mean, certain bottles. Yeah, I like. Okay. I kind of. I, like I don't know anything Wendy. about. I don't know about anything about wine. I'm not a. I'm. I'm not, I don't know anything about wine either. But I, I know what I like. I, you know, I. I like kind of a smooth red. I, I'm not a. Yeah. I'm not a. I'm not a white wine drinker. I can't okay. drink white wine. Nothing. No, I don't like chilled wine. But I like uh, a nice red wine. Like a nice uh, Merlot or Cabernet or a certain select Pinot Noirs. There you go. There you go. Uh, anything you want to promote? You got anything uh, coming, coming up, up on, that you yeah. uh, that you're doing besides your golf at Wenty? Everybody, get out to Wenty and and yeah. you, you know it, provide a gallery. Hit for that guy. like button on my uh, on my on my round of golf tomorrow. Uh, I think I'm going to do some Lombardi and I are going to do a show Thursday. Nice uh, Thursday morning. So. Uh, tune in for that yeah good good stuff thanks to pig and a pickle for being the title sponsor of the crew show thanks to guy thanks to all you guys and have a great tuesday enjoy the day peace yeah never met a man i've been scared of careful you go